Welcome to Soil Sessions, a webinar series by the Soil Health Partnership. Thank you for joining us. I'm Stacy McCracken, the Communication Lead for SHP. Please join me in welcoming our host, John Stewart, SHP Field Manager covering Indiana and Kentucky to start this soil session. Welcome everyone. I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is John Stewart and I'll be your host for today's Soil Health Partnership Soil Session. Um, I'm excited to be here for our May webinar. Uh, today, we're going to discuss some um, seeding options for cover crops during the summer months. Um, one of the main challenges uh, many farmers face with cover crops is finding the time to execute their cover crop plan. Time is scarce and will during the fall due to harvest. So some farmers choose to seed during the cash crop growing season. More and more farmers are beginning to utilize aerial applications and air management systems to seed their cover crops. It is an time and labor that is so precious in the fall and uh, it also opens up some additional flexibility and op options for species to use. Uh, the Soil Health Partnership um, webinar will discuss uh, options and hopefully some helpful things to think about when planning um, your possible aerial cover crop seeding application. Okay, so um, for introduction, a little bit about my background um, and experience. I'm a field manager with SHP and I am located in central Indiana. Uh, live, um, I started with SHP in May of 2018 and I cover a territory of the southern half of Indiana and um, it's our new expansion into Kentucky. Uh, my primary role with SHP is to work with farmers enrolled in a program in my area. I help to plan and execute their research trials, collect data, return reports, and then also coordinate um, different outreach activities. My uh, work background um, has involved several roles in agronomic research and development, a consulting company, and a couple different seed companies. Uh, I really enjoy the process of, of agricultural research and farm management systems, uh, so this role has been great for me. Uh, for my education, um, I've got a bachelor's in agricultural economics from Purdue University, and I completed a master's in agronomy from Iowa State. Okay, so the topics for today's webinar, uh, we're going to focus on several topics related to the aerial seeding crops into standing crop fields, um, give an overview of aerial seeding, equipment to perform it, um, some tips on finding a depending on what crop you are flying into and how we are collecting aerial seeding information from some of our test plots. I'll also go over some soil health partnership um, aerial seeding data from those trials and uh, cover a few resources to help um, you all gather some more information. Okay so diving in uh, what exactly is aerial seeding? Basically I think of it as the spreading of cover crop seed into a growing or mature standing crop. Um, for today, our, we're going to focus on aerial seeding application timing during that late summer period. Typically, uh, this is when the cash crop is mostly mature and um, typically just beginning to senesce. Uh, aerial seed is typically flown on with the airplane during this winter. However, in some areas it's applied um, with a helicopter uh, and a ground rig. So today I'll compare uh, some of the pros and cons of each of those types. Um, aerial seeding is an option for many farmers to apply their cover crops at a time when it's really not feasible as uh, some other methods of application. Uh, unless you have corn for sun, drilling a cover crop in late August or early September is unlikely uh, to be an option due to there being a standing crop in the field. Farmers who choose to aerial seed are hoping to take advantage of a longer growing season for the cover crop uh, and attain you know, better growth before we get that killing frost in the fall. Uh, I'll dive deeper into why someone might choose this seed option um, here on in this presentation. Okay, the transition. So not all seeding, seeding methods work for every farmer. There's many options out there. Uh, as a point of reference, I wanted to compare aerial seeding and its timing versus uh, some other methods um, farmers are using to seed their cover crops. Um, so here in the next few slides, I'll, I'll cover some of that. Okay, so um, one of the most common methods, uh, drilling cover crops after harvest. 
Um, so uh, <clears throat> a small seed grain drill is typically used for this. Uh, these are what many farmers are using to sow wheat and barley. Um, so a nice thing about that is they may already own the equipment. Um, typically with that, you're looking at uh, pretty narrow rows of seven, seven and a half inches wide. Uh, drilling seed in this manner is a great way to establish cover crops as the seed to soil contact will be much better than aerial seeding. Uh, even application across the field uh, is more likely versus flying on also. Um, unfortunately, drilling seed is, uh, drilling seed in is very time consuming and not everyone has a small grain drill available for the application. Uh, since the seeding takes place directly after harvest, it can be a challenge to take the time to get it done. Uh, when there are more fields to harvest, uh, it's hard to take a day uh, of your time to, to get lined up and, and seed those fields with cover crops. Uh, it is also a risk or maybe not even feasible in some areas uh, due to the chance of an early frost or freeze. Oftentimes there's not a large enough window of adequate weather to get the cover crop established with this seeding method. Uh, so depending on your area, successful establishment with drilling may have to involve adjustments to your crop management. Uh, earlier maturity varieties and planting earlier can help open up the window post harvest to get your seeding done with a drill. Uh, another method to seed cover crops is to broadcast them on post harvest. Uh, this application type is a good option for uh, a number of reasons. Broadcasting is typically performed by a dry fertilizer type applicator or a spreader hooked to a tractor implement. This option can have wide swath widths and be driven across the field quicker than a tractor and drill. I've seen several farmers combine their cover crop seed with a dry fertilizer application. Uh, while that means there's now um, a larger volume of product to apply, this uh, eliminates the having to make two passes across the field. A downside to a broadcast application is poor seed to soil contact as it will be uh, sitting on top of the ground also. So for better germination, uh, many farmers also will lightly work it in. Um, a similar method to broadcasting is using um, one of the cover crop seeder boxes. Uh, these can be attached to tillage tools, corn heads or other equipment. Um, they're pretty versatile um, and uh, like I said, can be used on a lot of different types of equipment. Um, I've seen them probably most commonly on um, tillage tools like uh, the, the VT type tools that you can use to get across a field pretty quick. I um, also wanted to compare aerial seeding timing uh, with the application method that's getting some more buzz the last few years. Uh, early interseeding, especially in corn, has been gaining some popularity. This method seeds a cover crop into a standing corn crop at roughly the V5 stage. Um, it can possibly be combined uh, with a trip across the field, like side dressing, to limit an extra application. Uh, some view this timing as a way to companion crop alongside your cash crop, since both of those will be growing together for a large part of your season. Uh, as far as species for this timing, uh, more shade tolerant species would be the best choice. Uh, this timing presents some risks as uh, residual herbicides could interfere with uh, cover crop germination and growth since it's so close to that you know, post planting time frame. Um, so definitely think more research is needed to take a look at the system and uh, how species will inter interact with a cash crop when grown together. Uh, so really when looking at these systems, um, you know, they're all options. There isn't a perfect method of seeding a cover crop. Uh, these are just some examples. So the seeding type that fits your um, system best will largely depend on where you're located, your crop rotation, equipment available, and, you know, weather conditions for that growing season. Okay, so getting back to aerial seeding, um, we've now compared some different seeding methods. So I'll dive into why aerial seeding could be a good option for you. Uh, there's many reasons why aerial seeding could be a good fit for your cover crop goals. Uh, establishing a cover crop post-harvest has many challenges, like I mentioned, uh, especially in the last couple years, at least in my area, it's turned cold very quick. Uh, this has made the establishment of cover crops pretty difficult. Um, since aerial seeding applications are usually in that late summer period, there's still ample opportunity to take advantage of sunlight and heat during that growing season. Applying at this time gives a cover crop a lot more time to establish versus that short possible window after harvest in many areas. Uh, having your cover crop flown on can also save quite a bit on time and labor, labor versus a post-harvest application. 
Um, fitting in a cover crop planting is difficult uh, when you're still in the middle of harvesting, like I mentioned. Um, a lot of times, um, this aerial seeding application timing is hired out to custom applicators also, so there's some time and labor savings there. Another reason to possibly choose this application method is to take advantage of that longer growing season for the cover crop. This does open up opportunities to try some different cover crop species. A mixture of uh, a grass with a winter kill type species is a top popular choice for this timing. Winter kill species typically don't have um, enough time post harvest to establish properly uh, if they're planted in that October, November timeframe. Um, species like turnips or radishes, for example, they just need a little bit more time uh, for that growing season to get the most out of their growth. Uh, this time it could be beneficial for growers that have goals of grazing their cover crops too. For someone that grazes their crop fields, the addition of a cover crop uh, could provide valuable biomass when the cash crop comes off. Uh, for an example, like a rye species planted earlier um, versus a post-harvest seeding would have more time to grow and might have a better chance of producing enough that it could be worth it for a forest crop. Um, another benefit of aerial seeding is uh, you know, the, the reduction of wheeled implements across the field. Um, reducing compaction is always a good goal, uh, so limiting passes across the field could be uh, beneficial. Drilling or broadcasting post-harvest can be challenging uh, with those sometimes wet field conditions or cold conditions. Um, in a really wet fall, it might be hard to get out there and drill that crop after harvest. Um, these are just some of the reasons why a, an aerial seed cover crop might be an option for you. Um, depending on your area, the method that's best uh, could definitely change. Okay, so aerial seed and soil health. Um, soil health goals are the main driver of the adoption of, of cover crops into many farmers' crop rotations. Um, getting these cover crops out earlier and established could help to uh, definitely increase their benefits on soil health. Cover crops can help by uh, many factors like reducing erosion, uh, building organic matter, fueling microbial activity, building nutrients, nutrient cycling, improving water holding capacity, uh, and possibly reducing weed pressure, to just name a few. Not every cover crop species can do all those things listed, uh, and careful management is always needed. It is important to work on developing a set of goals for what you want to get out of the cover crop you're investing in. Uh, perhaps reducing erosion and stabilizing soil are your main priorities. Um, then a grass species like cereal rye or annual rye could be a, a good choice. Um, another goal could be building biodiversity and providing fewer fuel for um, microbial activity. Um, so that might need, mean a, a species uh, mix with several species could be beneficial. Now, uh, one great way to develop plan and goals um, is to work with an agronomist. Um, you know, they may have some ideas to help, uh, you know, bring to light some goals you might not have thought of uh, to begin with. Okay, so um, transitioning on, we will uh, discuss a little bit about equipment options um, for applying cover crops during this aerial seeding window. I'm gonna discuss um, what I've found to be the three most commonly used methods and uh, a little bit about their pros and cons. Okay, uh, first and um, most commonly used option, at least in my area, is the airplane. Uh, this picture is of a common type you see in many farming areas, um, spraying fungicides quite a bit throughout the growing season. Uh, airplanes are used frequently. Um, they seem to be more readily av available. Um, many retailers contract with pilots to apply those pesticides. Um, as another part of the business, some have converted their planes to have the ability to apply cover crops over fields. Planes can apply quickly as they can typically seed several hundred acres a day. Uh, where a plane can fall short is sometimes application uniformity. Uh, a drilled cover crop um, will have a more uniform seeding across the field. Uh, you know, they can get in those tighter corners or uh, right up to the field edge a little bit um, easier than an airplane. Um, also, if there's sensitive areas next to your field, um, some buffers may have to be put in place um, for those airplane applications. Uh, another type I've seen being used uh, to aerial apply the seed as a helicopter. Um, they're less common, at least um, in areas I'm familiar with, but uh, they're used in some areas where there's no close access to a landing strip uh, for refilling or refueling an airplane. Um, some models uh, I've seen they can be, you can fold up the 
the propellers on it and they can be trucked to the field um, with a semi or flatbed. Um, you know, typically for a helicopter, the cover crop would be seeded with a, a spreader type bucket attachment that uh, you can see in the picture. Um, an advantage of the helicopter versus plane is it can fly a little bit slower and might be a little bit more accurate in some areas. Um, so talking about those buffer areas, they might be able to be a little bit smaller. Okay, the third type I'm going to discuss uh, as far as the most common types being used um, is a ground rig. Um, so this includes sprayer implements such as a, a Hege or a Miller Nitro. Um, these have high clearance and um, some of them can even raise up and down um, depending on what cover crop you're in uh, on the axles. Uh, so you can drive over a standing corn crop and not do uh, a whole lot of damage to the tops of the plant at least. Um, one advantage of these is that there's a chance a farmer might already own one. Um, a cover crop attachment can be purchased uh, and used um, for seeding those cover crops. Uh, and a good advantage of this is they can be used all throughout the year, um, you know, not just in that late season timing. Uh, but most of these outfits will deliver the seed by air through tubes um, that go down through drop drops down each row. Application widths can reach up to 120 feet wide. And similar to a sprayer, they can have boom section shutoffs, um, which might help to reduce wasted seed um, from overlaps out there in the field. Um, good thing, ground rigs can be very accurate. Uh, they have uniform seed placement across the field. Uh, those drop tubes help get it right down on the row, but a uh, major downfall with them is uh, crop damage. Um, you know, when turning on those ends, uh, or if you have to go on, you know, at an angle at any place in your field, you're, you're going to run over some corn, especially. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, just kind of for fun a little bit, I wanted to add in a couple experimental options um, into the presentation here. Uh, so I have a FAA Part 107 drone license. Uh, I like to keep up on what's happening in the industry, how it relates, uh, you know, to agriculture. I uh, came across a drone pictured here at a field day. It's a DJI Agris and it's um, got capabilities to spray liquid or apply dry products depending on how you set it up. Uh, it definitely has capacity and acre limitations. Uh, however, I've read some articles about swarms of drones uh, applying pesticides or cover crops to fields. Um, so maybe that could be an option. I even read about one company who's, who's starting to hire that out and do it. Um, I've also seen some people using this type uh, to apply like some small demo strips uh, of cover crops for education types of events. Um, this particular one was through Purdue University. Um, so uh, in unmanned aircrafts, you know, they keep getting bigger and bigger. So uh, those capacities and, you know, acre capabilities should increase uh, over time here. And with all the research on robotics and unmanned implements in agriculture, I think you know, drones will continue to evolve uh, for applications like this. Uh, another option I want to highlight is just the ability to get out and test some cover crops yourself by hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you are unsure or willing to experiment with aerial seeded cover crops over a lot of your acres, uh, this could be a way to try it out. Uh, I've heard of people just using a, a simple hand seeder. It is possible to go out, you know, at different times throughout the year and plant or, you know, small areas to cover crops for observation. Uh, I think it could be a great tool to compare some some different crop species and different timings as well, and would be uh, pretty low in cost. Um, but while it you know might not be fun to walk through a cornfield in late August or early September, uh, it's possible to to get some seed out there in the ground to observe for the fall. Okay, uh, so next section in today's webinar. I would like to um, discuss making your aerial seed cover crop plan. Uh, a lot of thought needs to go into the decision to make sure you have uh, the best results possible for your goals. In this section, I will discuss finding an applicator, um, some options for selecting species, considerations for uh, different cash crops, and um, some possible issues that could come up. Okay, so one of the most important steps in this whole process is making a plan that works for you. Um, there are many factors to address to give your cover crop the best outcome possible. First of all, there are a lot of questions to think through on how to manage a cover crop. Um, you know, how do you envision a cover crop working successfully into your farm management system? Um, 
And thinking back to the soil health goals we discussed, what are some species that can help to achieve those goals? So species selection is incredibly important. Some species can winter kill while some will overwinter and can thrive in the spring. Um, it's important to ask yourself, are you comfortable knowing a green cover crop might be flourishing in the springtime? You know, do you think you can, we'll have the time and the application window to get out there and, and terminate at a time that works into your, you know, spring field work and planting plan. Uh, Mother Nature always plays a hand and can interrupt the timing of this process. Uh, so if dealing with cover crop in the spring sounds like a challenge you don't want to take on, it might be a good idea to, to choose a winter kill species or mix. Um, other things to think about for your plan include application timing. Adjustments uh, will need to be made depending on your area, your planting timing, how the seasons progress weather-wise, uh, what the current weather is, um, a lot of different factors like that. Uh, so for, um, for questions like this, uh, I definitely suggest some expertise. Um, so using the help of an agronomist is always a good idea. Um, they can help with executing this plan. So I definitely suggest using a certified agronomist or crop consultant um, to help with the planning decision-making process. A uh, certified crop advisor, uh, especially one who has local knowledge of, of the cropping systems and cover crops in your area will definitely be a great resource. They should have experience with what has worked in your area and have some knowledge to help you implement these uh, new changes into your management system. Another important aspect of the planning process is finding an experienced company and pilot for the application itself if you're going with the airplane or the helicopter method. Uh, many growers who aerial seed will go through their local co-op or seed company to line up the application. Uh, it would definitely be a good idea to research your local options and discuss results from growers or agronomists have, who have experience with those companies. Uh, it's important to find a pilot who's experienced in seeding cover crops from the air. A special consideration and adjustments must be made depending on the species you are seeding. Uh, for example, like an airplane's flying at a high rate of speed, um, so there's some factors that have to be um, thought of and calculated for the fall rate of the seeds, and that can definitely change on the species you're using based on um, seed weight and seed size. Uh, so someone who has experience flying different species on will, will do a better job versus, you know, someone who might not have as much experience doing that uh, application. Uh, another part of the process is to ensure or to ensure success is to have a detailed plan for the applicator. Uh, some crop fields could be near sensitive areas or neighbors who might not appreciate a bunch of cover crop seed being dropped into their roofs, gutters, or yards. Uh, so it's a good idea just to supply some detailed maps and instructions uh, if there's areas to be avoided or if buffers to need to be put in place so some of that doesn't happen. Okay, so moving on, we'll discuss a little bit about aerial seeding in corn. Um, for today's discussion, I'm primarily going to focus on into corn or into soybeans. Um, so diving a little bit deeper into the planting process um, for seeding into your standing crop. Um, you know, we'll primarily, we're going to focus on these two. Uh, when flying into corn, there's several factors to consider when planning your application. One thing to think about is that higher rates of seed are gonna to need to be applied to achieve adequate stands. Germination percentage is not gonna be the same with the seed on top of the ground uh, versus if it was drilled or worked into the soil due to that seed to soil contact. Uh, so a higher seeding rate is typically used when um, seeding at this timing. Also, timing is incredibly important for um, success in this seeding method. <clears throat> For corn, most resources say to target timing uh, when corn plants are just beginning to dry down. Uh, one rule of thumb I've come across is it's a good time to apply when 50% of the sunlight is coming through the canopy. And, and Although there could be some guesswork coming up with that estimate, um, and then there's also some other considerations uh, to think about like row direction uh, and geography. Um, plant architecture and row spacing are some other factors uh, to consider. Not all varieties of corn are the same and some will let more sunlight hit the ground than others. Uh, some corn varieties can be very tall with many wide leaves or they could be shorter with narrower upright leaves. 
um, dry down and maturity or some other considerations for um, you know their variety selection ahead of time. Uh, hybrid with fast dry down will also help uh, to get that sunlight penetration, you know, extend that cover crop growing season later in the crop year. Um, planting earlier maturities will also help to get the sunlight to the ground. Um, <clears throat> to do everything possible to ensure success of the cover crop, uh, you know, it might take some adjusting and planning ahead of time to select a variety uh, that might give you some advantages to give that cover crop uh, a good chance to start growing. Um, Definitely tough decisions. Um, you know, some of those to get to get a better cover crop growth, uh, you may have to, you know, choose some varieties that may not be the the maximum yielders or the longest, uh, you know, um, growing day or maturity corns for that area. Uh, row spacing is another consideration to think about. Narrower rows have been steadily growing in popularity across the corn belt. Uh, this does you know, maximize sunlight capture for your cash crop. Um, but it could make establishment of your aerial seed cover crop very challenging since there will be less sunlight hitting that ground. Um, soil moisture is also incredibly important uh, due to the late summer application of this cover crop. Uh, moisture can sometimes be in very short supply. The, the best chance for success is to have adequate soil mo moisture both before and after seeding. Uh, a good rainfall it is definitely needed to help get seed soil contact and kick off germination. If there's hot dry weather and dry soil conditions, uh, this will, will not be good for the germination of seed. Uh, if the for, if forecast for the foreseeable future is to be dry and your soil conditions are already dry, uh, you know, it may be necessary to postpone or completely abandon the seeding timing. Okay, so some cover crop options before uh, soybeans, so flying into corn. Um, once you've decided on a plan and timing for your cover crop application, it's necessary to decide what species you will plant. Uh, there's many options out there for seeding into corn prior to beans. Uh, depending on your specific goals, your choice uh, could change quite a bit. So I'll highlight a few of the species um, farmers and soil partnership have been using on some of their trials, but uh, you know, depending on your goals and your area, um, the, the best species for you could definitely be different. Uh, one of the most common choices of cover crop prior to soybeans is cereal rye. Uh, this species has been a great option for many reasons. Uh, for one, it's great at establishing and overwintering, and it can be seeded at many different times. Uh, it's very resilient like that. Uh, it's also shown in many areas um, to be able to help with weed suppression. Uh, in the spring, in many of the trials I look at, uh, I can definitely see reduced populations and smaller size of weeds in the strips with cereal rye versus without. Another attribute of cereal rye is its uh, ability to green up quickly in the spring. It provides a good cover crop typically, even if termination uh, needs to take place 10 to 14 days before planting, um, like suggested. One thing to think about is termination timing with cereal rye. Uh, many farmers would like to terminate in that window when the rye is about 12 inches tall, give or take. Um, for example, last spring in my area, there were several farmers who just never had that opportunity to get in the field and terminate. Uh, it was just, just too wet and too cold. Um, so then planting into head high cereal rye uh, became the scenario they were facing. Um, so at this stage, cover crop could still be terminated. And many of those farmers were successful and had a, a good soybean crop still. Um, you know, using glyphosate or um, some farmers use a roller crimper for termination there as well. Uh, so it's just some, some considerations that need to be taken with uh, cereal rice I wanted to cover since it's so popular. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Some other species we see prior to soybeans include uh, annual rye, radishes, turnips, oats, and I know there's many others that uh, farmers have used out there, but Annual rye has an extensive root system for improving soil structure, can help scavenge and bring up nutrients. It does not overwinter quite as well as cereal rye. Uh, radishes and turnips are used frequently as they can scavenge deep nutrients and also uh, help with breaking up some surface compaction layers. Uh, that is if they get that good downward uh, taproot growth. Oats can also be a great option in a mix as they grow uh, very vigorously and uh, I've um, Heard and seen that they can help um, other species in the mix to push up through residue that might be present there after harvest. Uh, it's also important to think of seed size for this application timing. Smaller seeded cover crops definitely have a better chance to get good seed to soil contact 
um, versus some of those larger seeded species. Um, really overall, depending on your, your area and soil health goals, species collect selection can vary widely. Uh, these are just some options uh, I've seen in, in some of our trials. Okay, so shifting to aerial seeding into soybeans. Um, so prior to corn, uh, it's kind of the angle I'm taking uh, for the presentation today, but it's definitely got its own set of considerations best based on many factors. Like I mentioned already, it's important to think about plant architecture and row spacing, even in soybeans. Um, narrow rows uh, also, you know, is a consideration there. Wider 30 inch rows will allow a little bit better chance of germination of the seed. Um, but back to plant architecture, a bushier type soybean plant, um, that's going to spread out more, reduce the sunlight hitting the soil surface. Um, uh, while that might help to maximize your yield in your beans, it might not help to maximize your germination of cover crop. So it's definitely a, a consideration. Uh, when flying or applying the seed into soybeans, it's probably even more important to hit correct timing. Most resources suggest uh, targeting the timing when soybean leaves are yellowing and just beginning to drop. Uh, the hope is get good seed to soil contact and not have the seed sitting there for long before the canopy drops and sunlight is available. This can be tricky to hit correctly in soybeans. Uh, oftentimes late season rains can uh, keep the plants you know pretty green and, and growing so it's definitely important to carefully monitor growth uh, before pulling the trigger on that um, seeding application. Um, again, soil moisture is very important in soybeans, just like corn. Uh, you know, having that moisture um, before and after application definitely will help uh, that seed germinate a lot more successfully. Okay, so cover crop options as far as species before corn. Uh, species selection in soybeans and ahead of corn isn't typically as straightforward as cereal rye like it is for a lot of farmers before soybeans. Um, there are many options to look at. Um, and different species to consider and research. A lot of farmers take this opportunity, at least in the trials I look at, to try to mix or species other than cereal rye or mixed with cereal rye. Um, some mixes I've observed in um, some of these trials include annual rye, crimson clover, tillage radishes, and oats, or different combinations of those. Many farmers seem to like the potential for oats and radishes before corn. Um, Oats are a great nurse crop to help the others in the mix get established while radishes have that deep tap root. Um, you know, at least in my area in Indiana, the oats radish mixes have been drilled in. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it, it's a risk of, you know, with that cold weather coming that they may not establish and, and get much out of them. So with this timing, it could be a better possibility. Uh, I've already mentioned it, but overwintering is a consideration for any cover crop. A uh, decision should be made on your species and on whether or not you want it to be around in the spring. Uh, I've heard uh, many people say the hardest, hardest part of cover crops is getting them to germinate and grow and then it's also just as hard to get them terminated. So um, if new to cover crops, you know, the termination um, aspect, if you don't want to have to worry about that in the spring, a winter kill species could be a good option. Um, while this could be a time to possibly experiment with some different mixes, uh, it definitely should be understood that these can get pricey. Uh, I've seen some six to eight way mixes that can get get pretty up there, pretty high up there in terms of price. Um, and uh, large bulky seeds, uh, another kind of tidbit or consideration is, you know, some of those mixes with large seeds, uh, that's a larger volume to possibly push through that uh, aircopter. So that might mean more passes or more uh, dollars per acre for application there. Okay, uh, when looking at aerial seeding, it's timing later in the summer. Uh, it's good to have an understanding of some potential problems. It, foolproof planning and results have um, varied in studies and fields I've seen. So when I'll discuss some issues could arise your fields uh, here briefly um, and uh, a couple ways to maybe help out with that. All right, so what issues could there be? Um, so let's say you've aerial seeding your mostly mature crop and everything is going to be perfect. Uh, well, ideally, yes, but uh, there's always a chance something uh, won't work in the way you pictured it. Um, so some of the problems associated with this seeding timing usually involves moisture, like I've mentioned, um, but also residue or pests. Cover crop seed at this timing definitely need the rain. Um, uh, it's probably the most limiting factor for having a good stand. Uh, it's important to have moisture in the soil before and after that seeding. Um, this will have that soil friable. 
it'll accept the seeds and have some good contact to get that germination going. Residue can also um, play a pretty large part in uh, the growth and germination of the cover crop. Um, really heavy residue from the previous crop uh, could trap seeds and, and prevent them from hitting the soil. And another consideration, if you are flying seed into really high yielding corn, um, the upcoming residue from harvest could be trou troublesome too. Really thick mats of residue um, has been seen that they can smother some of the seedlings limiting growth if it's too thick. Uh, poor germination is, is a major issue with this application timing. It's uh, <clears throat> it really is just a challenge to get a cover crop established while it is shaded by a cash crop. Uh, an application too early in either corn or soybeans can limit uh, germination due to there being excess uh, shade there underneath the canopy. Um, seeding higher rates uh, is one suggested practice to help uh, combat the, the lower expected populations. Um, one question I've heard is if uh, a large majority of the seed can get stuck in the corn canopy. Um, I definitely think and have heard that a small, you know, a certain amount is going to land in the leaf collars and on the leaves. Um, but from what I've read and, and researched, moderate winds should dislodge a good amount of that. And with applying a little bit of extra seed for this timing, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Uh, I've already mentioned, but even seed distribution can be an issue. Uh, aerial applications in wind is a consideration. Um, also, um, units that uh, might not be calibrated correctly for the species being applied um, could cause some uneven seeding. So, like I mentioned, with those different seed sizes, they could, um, you know, fall down, fall, you know, fall down uh, through the canopy a little bit different than others. So. Overall, this is, it is a risky time to seed your cover crop, um, but, but many people are successful at it and they like how it fits in with their management system. Uh, definitely, if you choose to, to go with this route, I definitely suggest scouting your fields um, to view that application and how it progresses through that late summer and fall um, to see how it's working in your field. Definitely suggest probably, you know, starting small with uh, some smaller acres so you can get a good idea and get comfortable with it. Okay, uh, pest pro uh, pests are definitely a possibility and they're another consideration with this timing. Uh, cover crops can act as a host or food source for many insects and uh, rodents. Uh, for the example here is a picture of some earthworm middens. It's been observed that worms can pull seeds well below ground. Uh, some articles say they might even feed on them. Uh, most likely it's not a, a huge issue, but I did find that interesting. Uh, other insects and rodents could you know, eat seeds or um, cause some issues with the uh, early feeding on the um, germinated seedlings. Um, have uh, read some articles and heard from some other field managers that uh, up north some slugs have caused some issues. Um, they can eat small growing plants uh, res resulting in reduced stand. <clears throat> Voles and armyworms uh, I've heard have also caused some problems in some areas, um, but that's typically the following spring if you have an overwinter species. As part of developing your plan, I, I definitely suggest uh, you know planning on having some time to get out and scout your fields. Uh, it's definitely I know it can be hard to find the time. It's not always fun to get out there in a mature crop, but it might help you get an idea of what's going on with the cover crop you've invested in. <clears throat> okay, uh, so for the next section uh, of the webinar, I'm going to discuss some SHP data and a little bit how we're looking at trial fields that have been seeded uh, in this timing. So the, you know, as an overview, the Soil Health Partnership started in 2014 and we've grown steadily since then. We're now located in uh, 16 states and we have over 100 side-by-side -side trials and 120 plus strip trial sites. With this many trials, it's possible to break down our data set in many different ways. It's definitely really interesting uh, to be able to dive in, for example, on our fields that have been seeded at the timing we're discussing today. Uh, okay, so the photo here is an example of one of our strip trial sites. Uh, I wanted to include this just as a good visual representation of how SHP research sites are being implemented. Um, this type of site will have data collected for five years. It includes soil health samples, routine soil samples, yield data, agronomic data, and management data. Uh, so from all this information, we can select out the type of trial data we want to look at more closely. Uh, so here on the next couple slides, I'm going to highlight a little bit uh, on about some of our research plots um, that have been seeding at this late summer period. Okay, so um, 
SHP has three core trial types. These include cover crops, tillage, <clears throat> and nutrient management studies. Uh, we also have a few farmers with cover crop studies that are including grazing. Uh, you can see from this pie chart, we are heavy on the cover crop trials in a program. 79% of the sites are currently using cover crops for their treatment. Uh, tillage and nutrient management studies are uh, also a very important part of the program. Some of these types of sites could actually be a combination um, of tillage and cover crops or cover crops and nutrient management. Uh, I, I like that we have these types of options, so our data set is unique. Um, we're looking at, we can look at a lot of different uh, farm management scenarios. Uh, we're definitely farmer focused, far focused and want the, the trial sites to work for each individual and, and you know, their management needs and goals. All right, I'll now go over a little bit of information from SHP farmer trials that are seeding cover crops uh, in this aerial or late summer timing. Of our cover crop strip trial sites, we had 10 reported sites um, that seeded during this late summer time. Of these sites, seven out of the 10 used a mix of cover crop species. For other cover crop studies, this is definitely a higher rate of using a mix. This is compared to 53% of our overall cover crop sites planting one or more species. So of the seven aerial seed sites with a mix, two of them plant with more than three species. Uh, the other five used either a two or three-way mix. So I think this data is pretty interesting. Uh, it shows the seeding timing has a higher rate of a mix of species. Uh, to me, this makes sense um, uh, for those farmers that are taking advantage of that longer cover crop growth to maybe hit on a few different goals. As far as planting dates go, um, last year they all took place in September, um, spread pretty evenly over the month. Um, and the, the locations of these sites were spread over the geography of the program. We had two in Indiana, uh, four in Iowa, three in Illinois, and one in Kansas of the sites that reported their information. Uh, I've come up uh, once uh, more sites are online. Uh, especially as we're adding more and more sites in the northern geography with their shorter growing season. I think uh, this option, it sounds like, might be um, a good choice for some farmers up there. Uh, I mentioned part of the data we collect includes uh, management information. Economics are included in this group of data, and below are some costs associated with application methods in our trials. Uh, the chart breaks down median costs for seed and application method. <clears throat> for 2019 was $15 um, uh, per acre, while median application cost came in at $12 per acre. Uh, I find the seed cost numbers pretty interesting as I thought uh, the prices per acre would rise quite a bit more when you added two or more species per mix. Um, I also think the application combination is useful. Uh, I expected that aerial application cost to be the highest at first, but the, from our data comes in below the cost to drill a cover crop, which I found interesting. Okay, um, so transitioning here, uh, this year SHP rolled out an agronomic field check program as part of our as part of our um, trial data collection. Um, data possibilities for that I'm going to discuss a little bit over the next couple slides here. So the the field check program is pilot many of our test fields for more than a year. Uh, this year we formalized this process and, and rolled it out in hopes to cover as many of our trials as possible. Uh, the main goal of the program is to tie data and observations to our soil sampling points uh, and use that information to compare uh, between control and treatments out in our trials. The farmer trials in SHP are a great resource since they have two different management systems in the same field to make sure we're collecting as much useful information as possible to, to document the changes in adopting a conservation-minded practice versus a managed system without that. So the data collected from field, je field checks is going to be largely agronomic based. Uh, this data will be a great addition to the rest of the data we collect off these trials, uh, which includes the soil testing, yield, economic, and management information. And so you know, as we get through the field check process, you know, we'll be able to, to break that data out by the different types of seeding methods uh, like that we're talking today and many other ways. Uh, for this slide, I'm just going to dive just a bit deeper into the information we're collecting with these field checks. We're looking at observations like soil temperature, stain counts for cover crops and cash crops, 
plant heights for cover crops, cover crop species numbers and identification, cover crop uh, just establishment ratings, residue ratings, uh, insect ratings, looking at uh, weed pressure and some disease resistance also. Um, so throughout the year we have um, four field checks and of the information we're collecting, it, uh, it will change based on the time of year, the time of growing season, and also what trial it is. Um, so we def developed this program as a way to just get that deeper level of agronomic knowledge. Um, our field managers were scouting a lot before this, but this is a more formalized way to really collect and put numbers with those observations we were taking. Okay, so we're getting closer to the end of my part of the presentation. Uh, I wanted to touch a little bit um, on uh, as part of the plan, uh, part of developing a plan to seed your cover crop. Uh, you know, every area is different, but in a lot of areas around the Corn Belt, there's uh, different groups like uh, university extension programs, farmer focus groups, uh, neighbors, conservation districts, you know, local agronomists, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely probably some options around you that might have some experience with aerial seeding. Uh, would be a great idea just to bounce ideas or have questions uh, to ask them. I uh, also just want to include, uh, you know, SHP, we're, you know, we're happy to, to take questions or, you know, have a discussion with you if you might have any questions like this. Uh, we're up to nine field managers spread out across the Corn Belt and all have a, a great uh, level of experience um, or might be able to put you in touch with a local resource that we might be aware of. So in conclusion, um, I think it's important to really weigh options for what seeding method uh, will work best for you. Aerial seeding is an option that it, it allows a grower to take advantage of a longer uh, window of cover crop growing season uh, compared to seeding post office or post harvest. It opens the door to experiment with some different species possibly. Um, as a result, uh, your cover crop and soil health goals could change or you know you might add some new ones if you decide to seed earlier like this. Uh, in my area, post harvest seeding is usually pretty limited species that can overwinter uh, like that cereal rye. Um, unless farmers are, you know, on some sandier ground or really getting in there early on some fields um, to where they harvest pretty early. Also depends largely on the, you know, the weather of the season. If it's real hot and dry and crops have come off early, it might open up a window there too. But um, if it's your first time aerial seeding, I definitely suggest, uh, you know, starting with a small number of acres. Uh, you can use that as your own experiment, uh, you know, to observe the process for a season and see what you think. And scouting this area would be great just to understand some pros and cons and you know see if it might work on a larger number of your acres out there so uh, with that I just wanted to you know thank you for attending the webinar uh, I hope it was useful I enjoyed gathering this information and information and presenting it and uh, with that I want to say thank you uh, 